Hello, it is Monday, November 8th, and when it's Monday at The Athletic, that means we're talking SEC football on Football and Grits. As always, I am your host, David Ubbin, with my co-host, Andy Staples, the uh, man so nice, they named the podcast feed after him. Andy, (laughs) welcome. Another week, uh, you are down in Gainesville. A lot happening down there. We will get to that. No, uh, in de- it's in detail quiet around here. Here shortly. Uh, but what a weekend of college football! Uh, was this the was this the the close calls weekend for for a lot of folks uh, outside of Purdue? What did our, I believe our coworker Stuart Mendel called it slip and slide Saturday. That sounds about which- right. He's got to work on you know, that's that's good. That's better branding than anything <laughs> ESPN ever did. I yes, I appreciate I, that one. I was in the weekend, uh, and that was a, a close call of its own. Uh, I, that's not something I've seen for quite some time. Uh, two goal line stands to uh, maintain their position. But Andy, before we talk playoff, Alabama, all that stuff later in the show, we have a special guest with us, G. Allen Taylor, your partner in crime down there in Gainesville, Florida. He covers the Florida Gators for the athletic, and he's coming to us from one of the most spectacular chairs <laughs> you'll ever see, bringing uh, the, the term accent chair and taking it to new heights. I love it. Uh, interior decorator slash Florida beat writer, Gian Taylor. Al, well, how has the uh, weekend been? I, I have to say, I think just watching that game, I called that Florida-South Carolina game one of the probably five most confusing scores mm-hmm. of the entire season as somebody who was there watching it. What, what did you make of that performance? Even someone in the program told me last night that this is right up there with the Georgia Southern losses as one of the worst in program history, but because... blocking um, Gators. Yeah. 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 Because, <laughs> if, uh, you know, obviously you're a 20 point favorite and you lose by 23. That's a pretty nice pendulum swing there. And uh, the level of effort and performance was so lacking that, you know, you could point to that as well. And obviously it, it, it spawned some or expedited some coaching changes uh, <laughs> this week as well, just because you don't want to risk going through another three games like that um, and, and having that sort of lack of motivation and that uh, inattention to detail. It, it was just, it, it was unfathomable how it, unfolded even when it got to be 30 to 10 at halftime i thought well the gators are going to score a couple times the third quarter at least make this thing reasonable and it just the it never turned it was the total wipeout and uh a, a, an average football team lost to a to a poor football team by 23 points was that you know watching that and seeing the the carnage and just sort of being in awe of of what was happening because I've seen South Carolina They're They're a team that's not as good as their record even shows. And their record is, is not fantastic, but they have not really been impressive at all. And then of course they're down to uh, Jason Brown who, uh, and if you want to hit us with the, uh, uh, the water boy, oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I can, I can absolutely do that. I, I, I have that cute. here, <laughs> but it's a, oh, yeah. know, it's a, it's a, a, a game that was just astounding to watch. And I was kind of wondering to myself, is Florida going to drop the big bomb tonight? It's like me, your Sunday. daddy, Roberto. I seen you on TV. They was talking there about how is. you was going to get drafted to the NFL. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to school, daddy. I'm, I'm not going to the NFL, daddy. I'm staying in school. He said, what the hell with school, don't we? We can be like Tiger Woods and hit that. A true king. A true king, Mr. Jason Brown. Uh, but I was wondering, is, is Florida going to drop the big bomb and this is that's the type of game that 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 you fire a coach and shock people after. Uh, I didn't think it was going to happen, but I wouldn't have been shocked. How on the table was that before we get to what they did do? Well, I think your next step was always going to be make staff changes to try to improve recruiting because the AD brought in Dan Mullen. Scott Strickland believes in Dan Mullen, uh, or at least he did <laughs> before Saturday night. And that's one of those losses that makes you – take stock, right? It makes you uh, uh, a little wincy. Uh, I don't think Scott Strickland's the kind of guy that reacts to one bad weekend, though, or maybe even two bad weekends. He's really evaluating the whole picture. And, you know, you got to remember that 12 months ago, Florida was 8-1 and one in the college football playoff picture. And I think there's a belief that 
if the fall can be so rapid, then the bill back, you know, within a year could could happen as well. And again, I think Scott's a very smart AD. I don't think you let go of a guy unless you know what you've got coming in behind him. And right, and I don't think Florida was prepared to fire Dan Mullen or is prepared to fire Dan Mullen. So you'd be starting from scratch trying to backfill. So I, I think I think uh, for now that the mitigating crisis management thing is change defensive coordinators, find an offensive line coach who can not let the, the top six offensive line prospects in the state leave and see if that doesn't rectify the situation. Mm-hmm. I Todd don't Grantham think it's going to rectify the. I, I don't think it's going <laughs> to rectify the situation, Alan. I, yeah, I don't now, think it is either. <laughs> here, here's the, but but it's interesting the the points you made, and this is this is something that I've brought up to a lot of people, and they say, "Well, okay, you know, got to got to make a change." Okay, who who do you want? Who's better? Who do you think the? And and I I'm not sure that Florida was having those conversations with anyone about who 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 might you want who who might want the job like these are all conversations i think maybe are that are being had now and in case there's another south carolina type game on the horizon yeah so defensive coordinator todd grantham gone offensive uh, line coach uh, and run game coordinator john hevesy also gone florida though uh alan for the country in average yards per carry why those two guys is the first and two does this essentially guarantee that Dan Mullen is going to get an 2022 reboot I think Grantham was fired as much for what happened in 2020 as what happened in 2021 because the defense as you know last year was mm-hmm. was abysmal and probably kept a great offense from having a chance to to win 10 games and maybe be in the playoff um but really this year, it was two games. It was the LSU loss and the South Carolina loss. Forget Georgia in between because the defense actually showed up for that game, believe it or not. But the the, the LSU carnage and, and what happened at South Carolina, two teams that had not run the football, and then they went off for over 600 yards combined rushing. That was, that was too much to ignore. The kids weren't playing to save the D.C.'s job. There was no communication. There was no fight. You had to make a change. Hevesy's uh, dismissal, is 95% tied to recruiting. Uh, they've actually been serviceable on the offensive line. You, you, I know the offensive line is not what people want, but you can't have the number one passing offense in the country last year and be something like number 10 now in rushing this year and not get something out of the offensive line. I know they're not to the level that they want to be with Georgia and Alabama, but the fact is they have no depth on the offensive line. And looking forward to next year, I don't know how they find five guys, SEC caliber guys, on that line because they're not backfilling it and recruiting. And I think that led to Hevesy being dismissed, which, as you know, ends a twenty-year run of he and Mullen working together. Can you can you can you can you patchwork it with the portal? To some degree, I think they're going to have to. Uh, but how many really talented offensive tackles are jumping in the portal? You know that's. That's you're going to take a cast off to some degree. I mean, their right tackle this year is Gene DeLance, a four star guy who went to Texas and didn't really pan out there. And now he's a third year starter as a super senior at Florida. The right guard is a super senior, came over from the portal from Mississippi State. So to some degree, David, they've already done that. Right. Mm-hmm. And you, that's that's not a recipe for success, especially when it's grad transfers. I think you can make a living doing it with a couple of two and three year guys. So you get some continuity. Yeah. But Again, somebody able to step in next year and play in the SEC, I mean, good luck. I think the portal in some ways is a lot like junior college, that if you're there, you're usually there for a reason. Uh, and it might work out for you at your next stop, but it's still a, a risk uh, scenario. Well, and, yeah. and this is, you know, it's interesting because a lot of these issues stem from recruiting. A lot of the reason that there is such negativity and pessimism around Florida's program right now is it feels like the trajectory is off. It feels like, you know, because if they had, if they had a top recruiting, and it's interesting because you know, they they play Missouri in a couple of weeks. Missouri's having an awful season, and and the heat on Drinkwitz would be pretty high right now if he didn't have a very good for Missouri, maybe not necessarily good for the SEC, but a good for Missouri recruiting class coming in. Florida has a not good for the SEC, not good for Florida recruiting class at the moment. Obviously, there's still time to change that. Mm-hmm. But I think that's that's 
a big part of the negativity surrounding the program. And so that's why, because think about, it's probably not easy for, for Dan Mullen to fire John Hevesy. These guys have been together since Bowling Green and Bowling Green, Utah. They were at Florida together. They're at Mississippi state together. They, you know, Hevesy comes back to Florida with Mullen. They've worked together. John Hevesy was the guy who recruited Dak Prescott. Like, maybe as important an assistant to Dan Mullen as there is. And so I, I this is, I guarantee you this was not done lightly. Yeah. How much for, for, for either of you guys, how much do you get a sense of, I know his comments on recruiting in the last week have caused our good friend Ari Wasserman to be out on the Dan Mullen era, but how much, how much did that hurt him with his bosses at Florida saying big picture this makes me concerned about the trajectory of the program. It was that, just that that had not, not what he fire, said. Right? Yeah, it's it's his not not recruiting well is the problem. Well, but it's a combination, right? You can be if you're recruiting well and you say that, it's kind of like, oh, well, he just doesn't want to talk about it, whatever. But no, if you're not, recruiting, if you're recruiting well and you say that, then nobody cares because you're recruiting well. Exactly. Exactly. I'm saying it's a combo because if you're recruiting really poorly and you're like, we're trying, we got to get this. We know this is really important. It says, well, all right, we'll give him some time. At least he sort of gets it, even if the results aren't there. But when the results aren't there and you don't get an opportunity when you and, and you, you know, shrugging off, trying to uh, portray how important recruiting is to your program, especially a day after the Kirby Smart uh, diatribe about recruiting, which did not help him at all. It seems like a, a problem, but 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 Al, did you get a sense that 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 hurt him in terms of the the confidence level within the program? I think it hurt him again, just purely from a PR standpoint of having to double back on Wednesday and talk about it, and just being dismissive, quite frankly, of a question from a guy who's very much on his side, like a fan side, and not wanting to talk about that. Dan has not grasped the fact that. There is a way through the media at times to improve the perception of your program. He absolutely doesn't believe in that. Didn't allow anybody to watch any spring ball. Didn't want to have a spring game. Didn't allow anybody in to see uh, fall practice. Um, I think 12 SEC schools were on the SEC network with their spring games. And Florida was one of the two schools that ran some boxed up sort of hard knocks knockoff that was quite frankly unwatchable. And I'm like, why are you punning on this? If you want to talk about the brand and the logo and getting your name out there and be in that program, then let, let them watch you coach and play football. And he, he doesn't grasp that, and he creates situations for himself. I don't think that bothers him with Strickland, except to the degree of, come on, Dan, you can do better, and we don't have to deal with these headaches. But like mm -hmm. Andy said, you cannot be looking up at South Carolina in the SEC standings and the 24-7 recruiting <laughs> rankings. Problem. And make Big that problem. comment because it just seems ridiculous. And you invite everybody who doesn't understand anything about recruiting to actually think that you're not doing anything during the season when, in fact, Dan is, but it sounds like he is. We'll, we'll close with this. The only question that I think really matters is can it be fixed and how does it get fixed? Is this a situation where you can make a couple tweaks uh, do a couple schematic things, add some wrinkles, maybe add a few guys in the portal. And in the next two years, can you look like a team capable of competing with Georgia for the East over the course of a season? Florida's look good at points this year, but not very consistently. It, it, can this be fixed? When the season started, I thought Florida had no depth, but their starters were, you know, 10 win quality. Now I'm not even of the impression that the starters are there. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously the depth isn't. I don't see them competing for a college football playoff berth in the next two years. I do see them being nine and three, 10 and two, which is, let's face it, that's what they were when Dan came in. You know, uh, if you ask, can it be fixed? You know, could it be fixed in 2017 when they were four and eight? And the next two years they won double digit games. And in year three, they were eight and one. So yeah, it can be fixed. Um, there's got to be a strategic change in recruiting. I think they really need to, to, to focus on Florida and, and not devote resources to chasing 50-50 guys elsewhere as much as they do. Um, and obviously, we'll see what the defensive coordinator change uh, brings about. You bring in the right guy, put some juice on the defense, and, uh, and, and help defensive recruiting, then you know I think there's a, there's a chance for this team to be 9 or 10 wins again next year they should, they should have been nine wins this year. They've just fallen apart and they haven't achieved. Um, 
they're not a four and five team right now, but your record is what you are. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Okay. Uh, I don't have a ton of confidence that they can do what they want. You know, Alan talks about uh, it's not a team that can compete for a college football playoff berth in the next two years. Well, then that's not good enough at Florida. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the, the expectations are what they are and it's, you're supposed to compete for national championships at Florida. And whether that's realistic or not, or fair or not, is not really the question. That's just what it is. And uh, if, if Scott Strickland doesn't understand that, then he may find himself on the hot seat in, instead of Dan Mullen. Uh, as far as Mullen goes, he's got to win out to, to make sure he even gets to hire the next defensive coordinator. And, and if they play the way they played against South Carolina, they could lose to Missouri or Florida State. So they're going to have to get that part fixed. Uh, to be competitive next year, they're either going to have to have some really big time near signing day flips for this recruiting class, or they're going to need to do kind of have a Mel Tucker-esque performance in, in the transfer portal and, mm -hmm. and really reshape the roster because they're, they're not in a position where they have the roster that can compete with Georgia or Alabama, uh, Texas A&M, Auburn. These are, these are the types of programs that, that Florida is supposed to be competing with, and they're just not. And I, I'm going to disagree with Alan on, on focusing on the state. That's not how you win national championships anymore. You go where the players are. Georgia, like Georgia runs out an offense where the tight ends are from Las Vegas and Napa, California. Like mm -hmm. you get the best players wherever they are. And if Florida is not prepared to try to get the best players, then they've resigned themselves to never competing for national titles. Yeah. yeah it, you you got to be a little more audacious. I think from your campus, and a less talented player in Texas, and you spend weeks on the Texas guy. Well, you don't. No, no. You see, the key the key phrase is less talented. You go after the most talented yeah. wherever they are. Well, I think they are. Like, the most talented for them, quite frankly, is within a five hour footprint in a lot of ways. But um, if there's big time guys, you have to chase them, and it's a results business. Yeah. And you got to win, and if you're not winning, George, you're, you're George get has got lots of talented players in the state. <laughs> yeah. They went to get Brock Bowers from Napa, California, because he was better than them. At Darnell Washington, they don't make a lot of those guys. You watch him, right. you're just like, right. oh my right. gosh. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan Davis is from Charlotte. That's not yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. Why did they I, get I Jordan think Davis? Because they thought he could be really good. Yeah, I think it's a matter <laughs> of if you, if there's you are. A strikeout. There's, a, there's a homer and a strikeout feel to some of these far flung things. And uh, again, I'm just saying you, he's, getting, he's getting beat recruiting because guys like. Uh, you know, Alabama are coming in and taking the top five guys out of Florida. Yeah, you know why? Because mm -hmm. Alabama identifies who the best players are and goes and gets them <laughs> wherever they are. Like, that's the whole yep. point. Mm -hmm. like, if, I think if you, you want to win eight, nine games a year, by all means, just concentrate on your state. If you'd yeah, like I, to win national championships, go try to get the best players. If you're going out to Florida, if you're going outside of Florida and spending time and you're not, and you're spending time and you're not being able to get traction on these guys, and you're not able to, uh, you know, you're spending a lot of time and you, 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 you're losing out of state and you're losing in state. I mean, it's just not good enough. I, I don't think, well, I, we, I agree we, with Andy. I don't think we, the answer is to try and we focus live in on this, the we, we live in the super team era in recruiting now. Cause these guys all, it used to be, yes. If the closer you were to the player, the better chance you had. But now with elite prospects, they all meet each other at these camps. They all befriend one another and they all want to play together. Yeah. So, it's a, the trick is getting one or two of them to buy in and then they're going to tell all their friends wherever they're and their friends aren't necessarily guys they play with. They may yeah. be a guy that lives halfway across the country. But, figuring out which ones are the influential guys too. Cause it's not yeah, as simple as just the quarterback stuff. anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, thank you for joining us. Uh, Alan, it's, it's been awesome to talk to you. Good luck. Uh, this is going to be an interesting finish this season in Florida. If you lose to South Carolina, I don't think you can gloss over Missouri and Florida State. Probably Sanford, but I think okay. they'll beat Sanford. <laughs> they'll be okay against Sanford in theory. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some interesting stuff to cover, and we'll be talking plenty of Florida over the next month. Thanks, Sal. You bet, guys. Andy, I have a confession. Um, okay. You and I both know and love. Ari Wasserman, uh, I was listening to your reaction show on my way back from uh -huh. Cincinnati. I, w I almost stopped the car and called Ari to fight him. 
Uh, this was, <laughs> this, this, listen, to a point, Andy, to a point, I am with him on stars mattering. But right. when he suggested that the committee just put the four best and, and define them, he didn't explicitly say this, but he definitely leaned into the idea that just put the four most talented rosters in the playoff. Uh, oh, I, Andy, I, I push back I, I on this as well. I appreciated your, <laughs> yes. I appreciated your response. Uh, they, 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 they do play the games. They do play the games. Um, right. The games have to matter. Brings us to the discussion of the Alabama Crimson Tide, Andy. And uh, I wrote last week about how the committee operates. And um, when resumes are close, kind of the advanced numbers that you lean on, we calculated those advanced numbers based on the 2021 data. And Alabama, other than Georgia, was was they're strong in every metric. Um, because they beat the heck out of teams. They did not beat the heck out of a still very talented LSU team on Saturday night. But Alabama's number two, I don't think they're going to move, despite sort of kind of struggling with the um, – that, you know, the 29-point line is ridiculous because LSU has their issues, and they've looked very – but people forget – they're still probably the sixth or seventh most talented team in the country. We have to look at the, the 24-7 talent composite. Um, so it, it, uninspiring, but not sort of, you know, sort of, uh, I think uh, where I'm, I'm sounding a five-alarm fire in Alabama. But I do think they're the second-best team in the country. But where do you stand on them, the committee, sort of anointing them the same when obviously the human polls look, look very, very different? There's not really a lot of, a better option to put there. Yeah, yeah. I, that that's that's the issue. You're gonna put Cincinnati there. You saw Cincinnati. Did I did. Cincinnati win two games against those types of teams to win the national championship. I don't think they probably. Can. Okay, and and that's and that's why Alabama is where they are. You know, I, I I think they'd love to be able to put Oregon there or or, or Ohio State or or even Oklahoma, which is undefe- an undefeated Power Five team, but they nobody's shown any real evidence that they're foolproof. They're just not that yeah. you know, Alabama is, is still the kind of the, the next best out of that group. You know, George is the only one that doesn't leave us with a bunch of questions. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, it's not a great situation, but it is a situation that could work itself out because either Alabama gets better and wins out and, beats Georgia and they make the playoff or Alabama loses to Auburn and iron bowl or loses to Georgia in the sec championship game. And they're out anyway. So yeah. that, that situation handles itself. The, the big 10 situation with Michigan and Ohio state and, and Michigan state will handle itself. They'll all play. And Michigan's got Penn state this week that that could be a losable game for them too. So, and we'll see. And Oklahoma hits the meat of its schedule as well. So we're, we're about to, to see more, and I, I, I'm going to ask you this about Cincinnati, and I realize this is an SEC podcast, but this affects the entire playoff very picture much does. and also everybody else. Cincinnati playing the way it's played against Navy, against Tulane, and against Tulsa. Can it beat SMU and Houston playing that way? Not playing that way, um, but they haven't played very well. Um, they gave away... Uh, a bunch of points, uh, a bunch of plays. You know, they sprinted out the gate uh, against uh, Tulsa in both halves and then kind of just didn't play very well in the back half. Tried their very, very hardest at the end to give that game away <laughs> or at least get it pushed to overtime. And uh, the defense sort of stood up there at the goal line. So, no, not playing like that. Are they capable of beating Georgia, I would say no. I think Georgia beats Cincinnati 9.8 times out of 10. Are they capable of beating Alabama? Andy, I would say yes, a couple times out of right. 10. Right, in a one-game situation. And, and, and that's can. the, that's that's the reason else. why they should be considered for than Georgia that I think they can't beat, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's where, obviously, you have to play really well. Um, but Cincinnati's defense is for real, and Desmond Ritter can make some plays. Um so, you know, when you look at where the committee 
is landing these teams. Alabama, I think one thing that that made people a little more surprised with Alabama is they have better wins than people realize. Because when they beat Mississippi State, Andy, that didn't right. feel like a win over a top 20 team. But guess what? It was. <laughs> yeah. Mississippi, well, Mississippi State, I don't know if they're not going to be a top 20 team. This Not anymore. Because they lost Arkansas, but, but time, Alabama's going to play. Were. Alabama's going to play Arkansas and presumably beat them. Yes. So yes. that that all that's sort of six of one, half dozen of the other. And Alabama, the way they beat Ole Miss, I think is it, yep. it, it helps a lot. They're just it, there's a lot of a lot of reasons why Alabama is here. I'm just not sure Alabama is the same Alabama that we've seen the last few years. I mean, they're 100% it's hard not. to be what they were last year. I yeah. was talking to a, a, a fellow reporter uh, at the Cincinnati game um, who, who spends a lot of time in SEC country. And I, and I basically said the thing about Alabama and I've mentioned it on this show as well, is they don't play bad games. They just don't, they show up every single week. Well, right. Guess what we've seen from Alabama this year, Andy, Couple we've seen odd, them bad games, play yeah. some bad games. They played bad against Texas A&M. They just did. Uh, they played, I, I, I would say, I don't know if you can say bad against Florida. They certainly let up. They didn't well, play to now, their now that we've seen against Florida. Florida and, and I know it's hard to judge because obviously Florida's season has changed considerably. But yeah, when you look at that, yeah, it, it makes you question Alabama being that close in that game. Uh yeah. The LSU game, same thing. I mean, you know, Kentucky ran all over LSU and Alabama couldn't. What? Like six yards. <laughs> yeah. I, what? What happened? I believe Aaron, our our colleague Aaron Suttle said that that was uh, at least at some point. I think he tweeted in the second or third quarter. This is the worst he's seen Alabama play in recent uh, that he can even remember. Yeah, and 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 the issues. I will say it, it feels more on offense than on defense. Will Anderson, yes, is playing like the best player in the country. I. I, I think if the if the season ended today, he should win the Heisman Trophy. I will listen to those arguments. He was on my Heisman ballot. If there was this particular anonymous poll that our staff took, I can say that he might or may not have been on one of my ballots uh, for yeah, sure. I mean, so he's just he he just he comes to play every game, and he mm -hmm. just he's dominant. And seeing this offense go from just insane the last three or four years to really good when you can't just score 40 points at will, you can't just get out of bed and jump to a 14, nothing lead. You get in some fist fights like this. And you know, I, I don't know that I really believed watching that game that, that LSU was going to finish the job at any point. I thought Alabama would wake up at some point, but that that's what struck me is that we're seeing this Alabama team. Now it's, this is, Times where they've played teams that are not world beaters in Texas A&M and Florida and now LSU where they're just kind of like, yeah, they're really good, obviously, but they're not invincible far from it. Well, and, and, and that gives me, that gives me pause when they have to go play Auburn at Auburn. Remember and they you should, they've lost, you should. they've lost their last trip, two trips to Auburn and, there was nothing wrong with Auburn's defense in that game in College Station on Saturday. It was Auburn's yeah. offense that, that was the issue. So, I, I just, yeah, and, and it's okay. I mean, I think you you can hear it kind of when you hear Nick Saban talk this year because he's not breathing fire after these games. You you know, with with, with some of these teams, the, he would the have positivity been furious. Is very very interesting. Yeah, he would have been furious after a close win. I think he's very realistic about his team and and where he thinks they are. And when they, you notice when they win games that Nick Saban thinks were, were tight, were close, that were losable games, he's the happiest person in the world. And he seemed pretty happy after yeah. most of this stuff. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, to, 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 to bring our discussion full circle. While I disagree with Ari in that in the event of, of doubt you just put in the four most talented teams i do i did like your suggestion about the trump card of somebody's got to be at number two and i'm taking the team that on a neutral field i would take over the other six teams alabama yeah. very mortal very beatable still the best team so yeah they, they, say, they it, may it, both be it, overrated and deserving of the number two spot if that makes correct sense. 
But that's the, that's the thing. I mean, if this weekend taught us anything, it's it's Ohio State has its issues, Cincinnati mm-hmm. has its issues, Michigan State obviously lost, uh, Oregon didn't look good for most of the most of the Washington game. So you got to put somebody there. I I don't know. I don't know what else you do. They have to put a team at number two. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think I think that tiebreaker is probably the best way to do it. Well, Andy, about the team that did knock off Alabama. I had a good weekend. Andy, I'm sure you did as well. I'm not sure anybody, maybe in college football, other than Purdue, but even them. I'm not so sure. Had a better weekend than Jimbo Fisher and the Texas A&M fighting Texas Aggies. Andy, they beat an Auburn team. Just really suffocated them. A a really strong performance. That that's that A&M team is who I thought A&M was going to be, and they have figured it out. That team from the first month of the season, Andy, looks gone. That team is 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 out now. We don't see them very much anymore. And we see the team that I thought they were going to be. Ball control, tough to move the ball on, uh, and they did that to Auburn. And then, of course, they land a commitment from Walter Nolan, uh, the, I believe, number two overall prospect in the country. Right here from my neck, he's been playing his high school football in, in Powell, Tennessee, about 20 minutes from where I live. Huge pull for the Aggies, who kind of came in there late because as late as the summer, it looked like it was going to be between – Georgia and Florida and Tennessee and the Aggies can come in hot there. Uh, just a big a, for them. And one that, that gives them some more momentum going into this weekend against Ole Miss. They still have to take care of business. Ole Miss will be a tough ask. Ole Miss though, very banged up. Uh, everyone, it feels like is limping around. Their receivers are still uh, beat up, but the Aggies are now at, you know, by that win over Auburn or at the front of the line where if that, that uh, iron bowl upset happens, the Aggies are doing what they paid Jimbo Fisher to do, which is give them a shot to win the sec. Uh, what do you make of, of, of the Aggies uh, current lot in life, Andy, that, that, that they've, I, I was concerned that that Alabama game might be a flash in the pan, but it looks like it really was the turning point. Are you on board moving forward with them? I I think they can win every game left on their schedule. I think this week at Ole Miss is going to be tough. I think LSU is going to be tough. Mm-hmm. But they certainly are capable of it. What will be interesting is to see this week because I think they're going to have to win an entirely different kind of game. And, we, and we've seen them win that kind of game too because that's the kind of game they played against Alabama. You know, they won a shootout against Alabama. They won a completely defensive struggle against Auburn. I think they're going to have to win another shootout to beat Ole Miss. And – probably going to have to win another defensive struggle to beat LSU. So the fact that they, they've they've gotten to the point where they can win in multiple ways and from a talent standpoint, you don't question it at all. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're in a really good spot right now. Now, they they got to be the biggest Auburn fans in the world yeah. because they, they don't go to Atlanta unless Alabama loses another, uh, another conference game. So it'd be big Arkansas fans as well. Uh, but they, they do need to – just keep doing what they're doing. Uh, You mentioned the Walter Nolan thing. That's another one of more, you know, down the, down the page things about Florida's loss at South Carolina with Dan Mullen is, is they were in on Walter, Walter Nolan. And and that's one of the few times they've been in on the type of person that everybody in the country wants. Mm -hmm. And he didn't choose them. And uh, Evan Stewart, the receiver is another one that that Florida was courting. Evan Stewart was at A&M. This past weekend, he's from Texas. He's one of the best receiver prospects in the country. They may get him too. Yeah. I mean, Jimbo's been recruiting really well. This this roster, like, and this is going back to what we were talking about with with Allen about Florida. This is how you take a team and and build it to try to win the SEC. Now, are you going to win every time? No, like it's hard. It's really hard. But this is the kind of roster you have to build. And, you know, you, you've got DeMarvin Leal and uh, Kenny Green has been playing great. I think the, the, the offensive line for Texas A&M, once you know, they got over some injuries, they kind of figured out what their five were. It feels like once that happened, that's when everything settled down. For this, this could be a Maroon Goons game because Ole Miss, Andy, uh, gelatinous up front. 
at times. Uh, they can be they can, <laughs> they can be pushed around. There's no question about that. And I think this is a game where they may able to, maybe be able to do that. Um, but I, I think you know we, we not to get too far down a recruiting rabbit hole. But I think everybody wants to talk about uh, uh, the NIL poll and you know you know compelling coaches and all these things. And those things do matter. They do. But you look at, at at Walter Nolan, right? And you look at a lot of other recruiting decisions. A lot of times it, it still is. It's about relationships. Yes, that's a huge part of it. Who do you trust? Who do you like? But man, the on-field product matters. And I don't find it that shocking that outside of Georgia, Texas A&M has probably the best or one of the best defensive lines in the country. Yep. And they just landed the best defensive lineman in the country. He wants to go right. play in that, and he doesn't have to shoulder triple teams every single week because they've been recruiting really well, and they've got right, really they're going to have other well. good players. Exactly, yeah, and, and that's and I think that, that that's that, it's that, recruiting as for, as much as it's changed, it's still a lot of the same. <laughs> well, and, and like Georgia is sort of the same thing. We talk about Jordan Davis and and the the amount of attention teams have to pay to him. Think about this. If Nolan Smith had gone somewhere else, let's say Nolan Smith had, had gone to Florida or had gone to South Carolina or somewhere like that, Nolan Smith would be focused on every single place. Yes. Nolan Smith gets to work now because of Jordan Davis and because of Devontae Wyatt. And and you're exactly right. DeMarvin Leal gets to work because of, uh, because of Clemens and because of uh, Peavy. And I think, too, I think there's a matter, because I've seen this, is when that sort of second tier program that's not the elite of the elite gets that five star kid Andy, that that seems like a bleak existence to me because when you're that five star kid and you're coming on that program that wants to make that leap there's that expectation hey day one you need to start and you need to completely change our program like right. that's a lot on a kid and it's, it's not it's a lot of everywhere yeah. but i think when i think there's something to a huge advantage in recruiting Side of just having the best team, but when you're a five and you get to go to Georgia or you go to, I mean, a and somewhat, they've recruited really well, but the Georgias and the Alabama's and sort of just be a guy and not have the weight of the world on your shoulders. I don't know how many kids think about that or that they care about that, but if it was me or if it was my kid, that would be attractive to me to say, Hey, my kid's not going to go to this place. And if he's not a first team all American, by the time his first conference game plays, you know, fans are going to be about how he's a bust. I think that that does matter uh, in some ways. Well, it, it, it's interesting because we can kind of, it's not the same thing, but professionally we're dealing with that sort of right now. Mm -hmm. We're on a team that is loaded with five stars at the athletic. And we've both worked in places where it's been smaller groups of people, or we've kind of been on our own and, as news is breaking and you're chasing a story, like knowing that Bruce Feldman's on your team, the Jordan Davis changes of the how athletic. You feel. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you, you are such, so much more confident about how you're like everything. Our team's going to win this no yeah. matter what. Cause, and then if he has an off game, then, then you might have a great game or Cole might have a great game or I might have a great game. Like it, it's, it's very reassuring. And mm -hmm. I think this is why those players want to cluster together. Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, something to that. Andy, um, I think when you look at 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 the entirety of the coaching career a year ago, fair to say Josh Heupel inherited the most difficult situation of anyone in the country? Yes. That, that, that would be easy. Easy, yeah. yes. And yet, Andy... We're sitting here, and Tennessee, after going on the road and beating Kentucky, their first uh, win over a ranked team since beating Kentucky, I believe in 19, if I'm not mistaken. Tennessee is a very salty 5-4 and four, uh, on the track for 7-5. and five. They all, I mean, they if they're playing the right quarterback, they might have beat Pitt. They were close to beating Ole Miss. That job done. They've hung around with Florida and Alabama before they kind of outpaced them late. But Andy, when you look at the SEC coach of the year, I, 
the award is kind of funny because it is sort of a sorry we thought your team was going to suck award more than <laughs> right, the greatest right. coach. But, you know, I will listen to the argument for Kirby Smart and having a really good team and taking it to a, another level. But if, if you had the SEC Coach of the Year ballots out today, uh, are you voting Josh Heupel? Because I think I am at this point. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. With Kirby, it's one of those deals like, yes, it's a great – he's done a great job, and, and he's done a great job building that program. But it's also like your parents are both astrophysicists, and mm-hmm. you come in asking for $5 per A – and they're like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to get straight A's, dude. That's your job. So, but what uh, if you get what if you get uh, straight a hundreds across the board? Then you might throw something their way, which is what George is may, doing. May, right maybe, here. maybe. But but what Hypel inherited, and just the fact that they, because we were wondering if they would be able to show any any fire at all. Mm-hmm. Would they even have enough enough people on the roster? Would they even have enough guys who could legitimately play in the SEC on the roster? to compete in any games in the sec much less be competitive against some of the better teams in the sec i i just think it's amazing and and it's it's not just hypo it's a testament to those players because they did stick around you know they all could have left a lot of them did leave but these guys stuck around and they're playing for each other uh and then you've got hendon hooker who comes in and as a grad transfer wants to play you know comes in to play for another staff essentially I remember talking to him. Yeah. I remember talking to him when he came to Tennessee and, and I was like, cause it it was very clear at that the odds of them making a change were high. And I asked him, what do you think if they make a change? He said, well, I'm not worried about that. I'm just going to come in. And then Milton's the guy for most of the camp. And then it doesn't work out. And, and hooker has been unbelievable find. And you know, it's again, there's something to be said for when they, when they landed hooker and this was Jeremy Pruitt and the previous staff, it was kind of odd because this was obviously not an offense heavy program when he came here, but that was one of, if not the best quarterback in the portal um, at the time. And, and, uh, and he's paid off. I think he needed a fresh start uh, with some of the stuff that went down at Virginia tech and Tennessee needed a body, a quarterback. And and he has provided a whole lot more. I think big picture too, Andy, it's more than just the record. If you watch this team, they play they extremely like they're hard. Fun. They're having fun. Yeah. They're competent. They're competing in every single game. You're kind of scared of them, like quite frankly, because that offense. Well, and, can, and, if you don't show up, you can worry. get whacked. Yeah, that's that's the worry. Is what happens when they do have a roster? Yes, that has been set up to run this. That didn't just have a mass exodus. And, and I know that there's the. NCA stuff hanging over their head and that, that makes it hard to recruit, but it's still not, it's still not going to be as difficult a situation as what they walked into this season. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned the offense and, and everybody's scared. I had somebody, you know, who knows Georgia pretty well texting today. Like you think they can cover Tennessee? I'm like, wait, yeah, yeah, of course it's Georgia. And they're like, are you sure? Yeah. Cause that's they seem the to thing. Be able I to score on everybody. That's the thing. <laughs> like, I, I think Georgia will be okay. But Georgia might have to score 30 to win this. I yeah. Doubt. And no, I think I, they can. I, there's another Will, conversation but... we can have later about Georgia's offense being a lot better yes. than, than people yes. realize. But but yes, I, I, I think Tennessee has just been one of the stories of the year in the SEC just because we expected nothing from them and, and with good reason. And they mm-hmm. have proven, you know, they, they are now the proverbial team you don't want to play going into the late season. And they're going to make a bowl game. They're they're going to make a nicer bowl game than, than we would have predicted. Cause if, if, if you'd have predicted a bowl game before the season, okay, they squeak out a six and six record. If they ended up seven and five, I mean, this is about the best case scenario. Given and the fan, the fan base always handed. helps them in bowl selection as well, because they're obviously going to travel. Yeah. They're going to travel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I think too, Andy, you know, so much talk about the offense though. Tim banks rather publicly, was I, I forget what number he was in chasing after yep. defensive coordinators. It was pretty low, but this team, you know, everyone talked about, well, uh, I think I may have said this exact sentence before the season, Andy, that you'd rather lose games 55 to 45 than lose games 20 to 10, but they're not doing that very often, Andy. And the defense, yep. they wanted to attack They're fourth in the country now in tackles for loss. They've been leading in that stat for a lot of that time. They're getting after people. They're putting the offenses in really unfavorable positions, 
uh, and they're fun to watch. Uh, and and that's despite losing so many linebackers, defensive players up front, no Henry Toto, no Quiveris Crouch. It hasn't mattered. They found guys. Uh, Elante Taylor, huge pick six uh, in that game on, on Saturday, a guy that really stuck around, a Tennessee guy through and through, Manchester, Tennessee's finest. Shout out to Bonnaroo. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, you know, this is a fun team because it, it is a team that I think, you know, other than the 2016 team, and we'll stop after the probably A&M game, that team, I this is the first team that fans have, like, loved, Andy. They love this team oh, how because you, they play how hard and they stuck around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how could you not love these guys? And and they're fun. They're also fun to watch. I mean, they've had offensive explosions against Missouri, South Carolina, and Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And those were all games where we were like, well, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think they can do it. And, and they did it. They, they, they scored at will on those. The, the touchdown drives against Kentucky, <laughs> like the times on those drives are ridiculous. There, there's one that went two minutes and 36 seconds, I think. And the rest of them are all under a minute. <laughs> like, yeah. It's crazy. Also, do we have to talk about time of possession like in general? This is becoming like a topic of conversation around, around Tennessee. It's like plays are all that really matters. And yes, you don't ideally want your uh, your defense to face 99 plays in a game but when you're actually, scoring like actually that, it's david fine. there's only one stat that really matters <laughs> it wouldn't be points points <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah if you win that 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 is uh, much more cool uh maybe maybe next yeah, time it, when they throw a 75 yard bomb they'll have the receiver stop and just kneel at right. the 20 so they can get the defense a little more rest to make sure that they're going to be okay. <laughs> right. No, if you're if you're up 21, that also helps your defense because I remember the opposing offense one dimensional. I I can't remember what story I was working on. I think this was when I was at Sports on Earth, but I was talking to Mike Leach and I was asking him about the concept of like can you score too fast? Not in during a game like late in a game. And he's like no, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. If you can score, score. <laughs> He's like, right. I don't believe in now, scoring you, too you, fast. You can absolutely go three and out too fast. That's true. But yes. if, you're going, if you're going three and out too fast, fix your offense. That's yeah. not <laughs> – that's, that's your fault for not running a good offense. It literally is. I think people get so tied up in it, but it literally is, Andy. If somebody walked up to you and they, they punted the ball and your offense is about to take over and you could say, hey, do you want to take the ball – or how about we give the offense the ball back, but we'll give you seven points. Who's not taking that trade? Points. Because that's, yeah. that's what we're talking about. Like, you know, your defensive lineman might look at you side-eyed as they, as they reach for the oxygen tank, but listen, you're going to be okay. Uh, we'll see. But Andy, Georgia, we'll, 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 before we close, we'll look at next week's schedule. Obviously, we got to start with Georgia and Tennessee. This is the last real test for Georgia – um, before they head to Atlanta. Uh, I, I think Tennessee can make this competitive. I think they can put maybe a scare into Georgia. But you you alluded to it. For as much as we've talked about Hendon Hooker as being, savior is probably too strong a word, but uh, a, a very productive uh, player that the fans are loving. Well, there's a guy ahead of him in passing efficiency who people – won't stop talking about benching and his name is Stetson Bennett. Uh, you know, third in the country in passing efficiency, uh, Georgia still, as we speak, Andy in total offense, uh, yards per play. Do you know what they rank? Well, they're in the top 10 in the country. They're number one in the sec eighth, eighth in the, yeah. And yes, you are correct. Number and, one. And in the Stetson SEC. Bennett finally has enough attempts to be number two in the country behind yeah. Grayson McCall in yards per attempt. Yes. That, that was, he, he's been sitting there all season. He actually come down a little bit. He was at 12 yards per attempt. I think he's at 11.3 now, but uh, he, he's been one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the country. And, and with good reason, they, they don't need to air it out that, that often. Yeah. Because they're usually winning. They run the ball pretty well, but when they do throw, they tend to get chunk plays. What, what do you think it's going to take for people to, uh, it's amazing that Georgie pretty universally agreed to as the best team in the country. And yet somehow I feel like their offense is still kind of disrespected. <laughs> well, what, what do you think it would take? So good. It's because that, that seems so insane good. to me. Like you hear it all the time. Like, Oh, I think people just assume if you have this, like this, like 
suffocating defense that, well, you can't have offense either. Or if you score 50 points a game, that you can't also have a really good defense. People just assume that. And it's just not really true, especially in, in Georgia's case. They're explosive. They're efficient. They're powerful. They do everything that you want an offense to do. And yet again, people want JT Daniels. They want to say, uh, I think the casual fan doesn't realize how good Georgia's offense is. And I'm not exactly sure why necessarily. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is Stetson Bennett also gives you something that JT Daniels can't. He's a better runner than JT Daniels. Yeah, that's definitely so, true. So in this offense, maybe that's because because you talk about, okay, well, he doesn't have the the arm talent of JT Daniels. That's fine. You don't need yeah, he's not throwing all of 50 that times a game. He's not throwing all you, 25 yard deep outs. You don't need that. <laughs> right. All you need is someone who is accurate with the throws he needs to make. Yeah. And that's what he is. And, and, I, and he can get away and, and get you out of a play when when maybe the blocking breaks down. He can get get back to the line of scrimmage or maybe you've gained a few yards. So I, it's not it, it's a good situation. Stetson Bennett is not some ham and egger. He's a good quarterback. Yeah. And, I, and you'll have to excuse me because I have not looked up the advanced numbers on this, but there is people who track like interceptable balls. And in some ways that's subjective. I have to assume that Stetson Bennett's is freakishly low. And I think in all this quarterback talk all season long, which uh, Kirby Smart seems to be, I suppose, justifiably increasingly annoyed by, but we've still got to ask. I think it does just come down to trust. How is Georgia going to lose a game this year if they lose, Andy? It's gonna be turnovers. That's how. That's if somebody's gonna beat them. Yes, they're gonna win. They're gonna win the turnover so battle. Three and them. one. Yes. Yeah. You if, have to have short Georgia fields makes, or a big play. Yeah. If if Georgia makes you come from your own twenty five every series, you're going to lose. Yes. Yes. One thousand percent. And and Stetson Bennett it doesn't like you don't see him make throws where you're like, whoa, easy buddy, easy buddy. Uh, the mailman is delivering and he is reliable. Rain, sleet, or snow. He, he's bringing it every single week and it's i think in all of this i don't think you know if you truth serum kirby smart he would do anyone when they say jt daniels is 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 more talented but i think he would disagree i don't think he'd say it publicly but i think he has a lot more trust in stetson bennett i think that knowing what else he has it, I, makes a lot I, more i sense. think he says it publicly every time stetson bennett runs out on the field first yes i would say that's true actions andy they tend to speak louder than words, as I'm told. Uh, so, yes, I think so. Uh, Andy, looking at next week's schedule, what is the second game that's you, that you are? Uh, I think it's a and Ole Miss. Yeah. I, I think a and Ole Miss is, is a, just an intriguing game. And like we were talking about before, a and is going to have to win. If, they, if they're going to win this game and stay in control, well, they're not even in control of their but stay in the mix for an SEC West title. One game away from having a huge year. When it looked like it was right. lost, they 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 have to be able to win probably a different kind of game. They probably have to win a shootout in this game. Uh, Matt Corral is going to challenge them in ways that Bo Nix did not, and so mm -hmm. we'll we'll see. I mean, I I think they can. I we we saw them do it against Alabama. So and then for Ole Miss, this is a chance to kind of assert where you are in the West. That the way they lost to Alabama, you know, it, it's going to be tough to for them to get back in because they've lost to Alabama and Auburn and, you know, Alabama and Auburn play each other. So uh, if you're Ole Miss winning this one, maybe gets you toward into it, you know, getting into a new year six type bowl. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can win the rest of your, your schedule here. If you're Ole Miss. And I actually don't think and 10 and two ain't out. bad. I, th I think A&M can limit possessions in this game. I think they can slow it up. I think they can open up the umbrella and make, uh, Ole Miss, you know, beat them by a thousand paper cuts if they're going to, and not the haymaker. We haven't seen as much of that. I mean, part of it's because you don't have Elijah Moore taking the top off. The receivers have been banged up. Matt Corral has been banged up. I think AM can can really control possession in this game. You know, uh, I'd have to look at possessions per game, but I bet you they're going to take Ole Miss down to two or three fewer than what they average would be my guess in this ball game, and that keeps it a little bit more low scoring, keeps your defense off the field, keeps your defense in out of bad situations. Um, but that's that's going to be a really really good game. Uh, I like the Aggies uh, in that one. Uh, well, Andy, thank you for joining me as always, and thank you, listeners. Without you. 
we would just be two guys talking football and it would be fun, but we probably, I don't know if we can get paid for that, Andy. I don't know if that's a thing that you can do. I, I'm, ama- I'm amazed we get paid for this. I know. I know every day I am. It's very nice to wake up and not, it's truly a beautiful feeling. And I hope all of you uh, can do that at some point. And it is uh, our pleasure to bring this show to you every Monday. So thank you for tuning in. And if you would like to more easily have our show access the pleasure centers of your brain, you should subscribe. And it can be delivered directly to your device every Monday. Uh, so do that on whatever podcast purveyor you choose. They're all over the place. So thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, appreciate uh, our friend and colleague G. Allen Taylor to talk some Gators. It's going to be an interesting week in Gainesville. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you guys again next week on Monday for more Football and Grits. For Andy Staples, I'm David Ubbin. Thanks. We'll see you guys again soon.